and welcome to this week's YouTube video. Today I wanted to show you how I painted this tabby cat in oils, specifically using the Zorn palette. Let's get straight into the video and I will talk about what I am doing as I go along. This video has been speeded up, but I do slow it down after the first layer, which is the blocking stage. The blocking stage is very quick. I am thinning my paint with mineral spirits and I am laying an average value, average temperature and also an average colour. Choosing an average of each of these things will make it easier for me to adjust on layers 2 and 3. Once I'm done, I leave the painting to dry overnight and I will have another go at it the next day. It dries quickly because my paint is thin and also I am painting on paper. On to the second layer or second sitting. Layers 2 and 3 are where I make all the important decisions about this painting. The colour palette that I have used is mainly the Zorn palette. The specific colours I have used are Yellow Ochre Light by Rembrandt, Cadmium Red, Windsor & Newton, Ivory Black, Gamblin, Zinc Titanium White, Gamblin. I'm not sponsored by any of these brands. These are the ones that I use and like and have found they work really well together. I like the butteriness of the Rembrandt paint, plus the yellow ochre light is just a bit stronger in yellow and less muted than yellow ochre. I like the strong pigment in the red. My preference is for a slightly transparent white, which is why I like Gamblin. I have no preference for a black, I just happen to have this one by Gamblin. These are the main colours I have used in this painting. I do work with an extended Zorn palette in most of my paintings and I have used the addition of Ultramarine Deep Rembrandt again for the same reason I like the butteriness of this paint. I have also used Elysian Crimson by Gamblin. I have no real preference for the brand in this colour. I have used the Ultramarine Deep for the background and the Elysian Crimson for the cat's ears. This is the only two places I have used these colours in this painting. The bulk has been painted with the Zorn palette. A quick word about my brushes. This is a small painting, 8 by 8 inches, so the brushes I am using are small. For the detailed areas, I am using a small round brush. If I hold my finger up, you will see how small they are. These brushes will give me control, but my brushwork will be tight, so I'm only using them around my focal areas, which are the eyes and also the nose. I'm also using three different sizes of flat brushes. These ones are by Artmaster. I like these as they are cheap, which is helpful because they get wrecked quite easily. These are my workhorses. I use these to get enough paint onto my painting. I can load them up and get the paint on quite quickly with these brushes. Once I have enough paint on the surface of the paper, I will then swap to my coma brushes. These brushes are soft and flexible. I can make some lovely marks with them. They allow me to push and pull the paint about without taking off my previous layers or muddying up my paint. On to the actual palette itself as I want to explain how the Zorn palette works. The Zorn palette is very good for painting both people and animals. It is a very simple palette to master, especially if you struggle with colour and temperature. It will prevent haphazard mixing because you can't really go wrong. Okay then, you have warm, warm, cool, cool, dark and light. So it's very simple. If you want to make a warm colour, you use red and yellow. If you want to make a cool colour, you use black and white. Also, you use black and white to make it lighter and darker. My tabby cat's fur is brown, black and grey. If I mix my white and black, this gives me my grey. If I need a warmer grey, I can add yellow. 
If I need to darken my warm grey, I can add black. If I need to warm my black up, I can add yellow or red or orange. If I want to mix a brown, I can use my yellow and red together and then mix this into my darker grey. If I need to cool this brown down, I can either add black or white or grey. As you paint your tabby cat, just keep asking yourself, is the colour next to the colour I've painted warmer or cooler? If it is warmer, ask yourself, is it more red, yellow or orange? If it is cooler, I only have the option of black or white. For my really light areas, it is exactly the same principle. I can either use my white straight from the tube if it is cool. If I want to warm it up, I can add some yellow, red or orange. These four colours will give me all the colours I need to paint this tabby cat. I have my browns, my lighter colours and my greys. Now I have shown you how the Zorn palette works in relation to this tabby cat, I want to put it into context. If I show you a photo of the finished painting, I can show you the colour shifts. For my darkest areas around the cat's eyes and nose, I have used my black plus Elysian crimson. Black plus Elysian crimson will give me my darkest, warmest black and I will only use it for the eyes and nose. Conversely, my lightest, whitest area here the reflection in the eye, I use the white paint straight out of the tube. So in my focal area, I have my areas of darkest value and my areas of lightest value together. Also, for my cat's eyes, I have used red plus yellow in various mixes, plus a little white in the lighter areas. Nowhere else in this painting do I use my red and yellow in such a saturated way. This helps direct my viewer's eye to this area. For the rest of my darkest darks, I have used either black plus cadmium red or just black by itself. Notice the shifting in temperatures depending upon whether I have used a warm dark or a cool dark. So for example, here I have used a warm dark, so the colour I have laid next to it is cooler. In this instance, it is a grey, so black plus white. And you can really see that blue leaning in the ivory black when it is placed next to a warm temperature. Where I have laid just a black, notice how I have warmer browns next to it. My mid-tones vary too between a cool grey and a warm grey that then transitions into more of a brown. This brown is heavier on the yellow than it is the red. You will begin to see this transition in the bigger blocks of shape. For example, the left leg transitions from cool to warm back to cool and cooler still for the throw it is sitting on. It's these transitions that will give you your sense of form. They are very important. The reason why I am able to introduce ultramarine into this area just here and here is because ivory black has such a strong blue leaning. But note I have mixed my blue into my grey. I am not using this colour in isolation of the ones I have already used. I am just pushing my grey a little further towards blue. Notice the contrast this gives me with my orange. The additional blue notes of broken colour help make my orange pop. I am trying to work on the painting as a whole as I go along without stressing too much about any one area. For example, that background I have just laid a colour which I feel is closer to the final colour I will want to use. 
but I have still only suggested it with thin paint as this will give me an ability to adjust it later. I want to keep working on the whole painting throughout sittings two and three because the colours I see are affected by the colour laid next to it. I will not be able to judge the colours and temperatures in the cat's face correctly without adding that strong muted yellow, which is just yellow plus a bit of black. It is important to work on the whole of the painting rather than obsessing about areas in isolation of each other. It's important also to make that background as interesting as you can. The best way to do this is by using broken colour. Broken colour is a technique used where you lay strokes of different colours together unblended but due to their close proximity to each other, the eye blends them together optically. You can do this subtly, as I have in this instance, or you can be much bolder. Here, I have used yellow plus black with notes of yellow-grey, grey and grey-blue. Doing this will make my painting far more interesting and give it more life and energy and help integrate that cat into its background. By laying down that strong yellow in the background, you can really see how much that has affected how you see the colours in that cat's fur. And it is amazing how many colours just four colours make. I use this palette all the time for my animal paintings. Sometimes I modify it by swapping my ivory black for my ultramarine deep, but even if I use the extended palette of Elysian Crimson, Cadmium Yellow and Ultramarine Deep, I would say 85% of my paintings are done using Zorn. Zorn is a great palette for painting people and animals. Moving on to the final sitting or layer of this painting. It is probably more accurate to call them sittings, as layers can imply that the whole painting gets covered in three sessions. This is not the case, and you may have noticed on sitting two, I touched relatively little of the cat's legs, paws and body. This is mainly because I had got quite close with the temperatures and colours I'd laid down in the first sitting. I was able to leave it relatively untouched until the last sitting. Had I been further out with this, then I would have needed to work on it a little in sitting two. Sitting two and three were around three hours of painting each. Sitting one was about 30 minutes. You may remember in the early part of the painting that I spoke about brush selection. Up until this point, you may have noticed that the bulk of the painting has been done with the flat art master brushes. In this sitting, you will see that the bulk of the painting will now be done with the coma brushes. Brush selection at this point is really important because the wrong brush can cause all sorts of difficulties like muddied colours, taking off your paint from the previous layers and losing control of the painting. If you are attempting wet on wet painting, as I am here, you will find that the stiffer the brush that you use in the later stages of the painting, the more likely you are to run into trouble. For the shorter fur on the face, I was laying my paint a bit like a sticker, so I needed a brush that would allow me to do this. The shorter, stiffer hairs of the Art Master brushes allow me to do this. And I quite like them a little bit wrecked too, as old brushes can create really interesting strokes, especially for dry brushwork. For the longer hair on the cat's body, the coma brush is ideal as it allows you to pull and push the paint edges into each other and creates really lovely marks. I have filmed a close up of the painting so that you can see the brushwork. This effect would not be possible with a regular brush. 
I would say therefore that it is really important to experiment with your brushes and try to figure out the marks that they make and when to use them. Think about the different angles that the brush will allow you to apply the paint. Think about the pressure you use. If I use a heavy hand with a coma brush, it will still take paint off my canvas. Here I am using quite a bit of linseed oil as I want my paint to flow. Linseed oil will also make it easier to get longer expressive marks for the fur around the cat's neck. Once I start adding more paint on the cat's legs and chest, it is very easy to overcompensate in what I think I am seeing. Remember, I have already largely worked out my values, colours and temperatures in the first sitting. As I go in to paint the detail, it would be very easy for me to overemphasize an area that I think I am seeing. This will then throw out your values. I need to stick within that value range that I have already worked out. If I show you the photo of the finished cat painting again, but turn it into black and white, you will see how narrow those values are. What I am seeing is mainly a temperature shift. I have to be careful not to overemphasize this in the later stages of the painting. An easy solution is to work with two reference photos, one in colour and one in black and white. In the later stages of the painting, it is really helpful to photograph your painting and then turn it into black and white to check your values are still correct. I can photograph my painting easily up to 10 times in this last sitting to check I have not done anything majorly wrong with my values. Very often when you look at a painting and it seems wrong, most of the time it will be an issue with the values. And on a small painting like this one, it is very easy to get lost in painting detail. A good way to help prevent this is to keep standing back. Creating distance between yourself and your painting will help you avoid losing perspective of your painting and obsessing about one area. In the late stages of this painting, I will be standing back maybe every couple of brush strokes and then taking a photo, checking my values and then continuing. I will also pin a reference photo on a board I have one metre away from my workstation. This helps me to keep seeing the larger blocks of colour in the cat's fur. The reference photo immediately next to my painting helps me see the detail. It is important to keep your perspective on the larger shapes as well as the smaller shapes. If your painting feels as though it is all detail, it will be due to not considering the larger blocks of shape alongside the smaller shapes in the later parts of the painting. Invariably, you will have focused just on the small shapes. So for example, in this painting, these are my larger shapes that I have to make sure I don't lose in detail. I should probably briefly mention the light in my reference photo, as this does affect the painting. In my reference photo, the light is cool. The rule is warm light equals cool shadows and cool light equals warm shadows. Therefore, in this instance, my shadows here and here will be warm. This is why I added red to my black in those areas. It is worth noting that every photo may be different. And had the light been warm, I would have just used black as it was without adding the red. Also remember too that because this cat is in a room, there is a certain amount of ambient light. Ambient light affects shadows by making them warmer. For the cat's ears, I introduced alizarin crimson to the lighter areas. So here and here, I used a mix of alizarin crimson, black plus white. I opted for alizarin crimson because it is a cooler red and paired with black and white, it will give me the pink I am after. For the warmer areas around the edge of the ear, I have swapped back to my Elysian Crimson. I am not saying that every cat's ears should be painted in this way. For example, if your cat was backlit, 
you would probably be dealing with luminous ears, very saturated in colour. It's important to assess what you think the light is in the reference photo you are looking at. And it's best to view your reference photo printed out onto paper, as looking at it on a backlit screen will skew what you think you are seeing. Backlit screens will warm up all the light areas in your photo, which may not be correct if you are dealing with cool light. I hope you have enjoyed today's video and found it useful. Please like and subscribe if you can and check out my website sarahhallidayart.com where you will find examples of my work and also details of online classes that I run. Thank you for watching and see you for the next one.